Hi, I'm Kelly Chappelle, and in this video, I'm going to be explaining how you can interpret the output of the LM function in R and plotting. This is part of the Introduction to R tutorial series for Bio 47, Introduction to Research in Ecology and Evolution, a class at Stanford University, um, and this video was made in spring of 2020. So in the last video, I showed you uh, how you can run a linear regression model in R. And in this case, we sorted it as this object model back nectar. And I'm going to be explaining how to interpret the summary, the output of the summary function of our linear regression model. So the first thing that you do, and I'll just show you it briefly, what the output looks like here. So this is what happens when I run the summary model back nectar, just like I showed you. And you get this in the console, and I'm going to be going through the output of that with some annotations here in my, in my slides. So the very first thing is just the call, and that just says what your model was in case you forgot. Because again, we saved it as this as this object, and so maybe I ran this line a long time ago and I forgot, so this is just a little reminder. The next section is about residuals. So it shows you the distribution of residuals. Um, the residuals are the distance between the actual values and the linear regression line. And one assumption if, of linear regression is that the mean of those residuals is around zero. So this is not the uh, data that we're analyzing for class, but this is just an example from this source. But I think it illustrates really nicely that if you kind of visualize this linear regression line being rotated down, you get to see the residuals and they should be uh, their mean should be around zero. So here's a nice example of some residuals where the mean clearly is above zero or is uh, zero around zero because there's some points above and some points below the line. And you can see the min and max um, of those residuals and we can see the median here is minus 0.64 and um, I think for the purposes of this looking at what the spread is that should be okay. The next thing is coefficient. So this is the most important part. And because this column here shows the stuff you put in your equation. So again, for a linear regression, the formula is y equals mx plus b. So this intercept is the intercept or the plus b. So um, you could write our equation as bacterial density. That's the y axis, right? Because remember lm is y tilde x. So y bacteria density equals 0 0.06 from here here's the m times the nectar volume that's our x plus our intercept 0.852 y equals mx plus b so these are our coefficients and you can interpret what these coefficients mean you can interpret the intercept as the average log transform density of bacteria. That's what log back CFU is. When considering all nectar volumes is 0 0.85202. And you can interpret the slope as for every one microliter increase in nectar volume, bacterial density decreases by 0.6 CFUs after being log transformed. Again, that's a long way of saying what this variable represents. Moving on, what is the standard error? The standard error represents the average amount the coefficient estimates vary from the actual value. So you can interpret this value, 0 0.03074, as the amount of nectar in a flower and how much it varies. So the amount of nectar in a flower can vary by 0 0.307 microliters. And why would you want to know this? Well, these can be used to calculate confidence intervals and statistically test the relationship between x and y variables. Moving along the direction of testing, we can look at our t value. That is how many standard deviations our coefficient estimate is away from zero. And if those values are far from zero, then we should reject the null and say there's no relationship between the two variables and conclude that there is or there we cannot reject the null or there might be a relationship between the two variables. Depending on who you talk to and how stringent they are, they might say you cannot conclude that there's a relationship between the variables. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate right now, <laughs> but when you're interpreting a t-value, you always want to consider how big the t-value is relative to the standard error. So if this t-value seems like it's really far from zero, but the standard error is also really huge, then that is some that might not be as strong an argument as if the standard error is quite small and the t-value is also far from zero. And generally, t-values are used to compute p-values. So moving on to that p-value, the p-value is here and it is the probability of observing any value greater than or equal 
to t, which I just explained. And having a small p-value means that you're unlikely to observe a relationship between the x and y values by chance. So means reject the null hypothesis that they're not related. Generally, we use a 0 0.05 or a 5% cutoff for statistical significance with interpreting p-value. That's where these significant codes come in. So you can see that this p-value is just below the 0 0.05 cutoff. And so it gets like one little asterisk, which means that it's you know closest to 0 0.01. However, if this value was much smaller, we would see either two or three asterisks there. So like this number is quite small and it gets three asterisks. So that means that it's even more significant. So this is just a quick and easy way of looking and saying, okay, if there's an asterisk there, it means it's significant. And if it's many asterisks, it means it's very significant. And fewer asterisks means it's still significant, but not quite, um, it's not, it's closer to 0 0.05. Um, I think the last thing I'm going to talk about here is a residual standard error. So that's here, the residual standard error for this model is 1.215. And it's a measure of the quality of the linear regression fit. So the average amount, in this case, the average amount of the response, which is bacterial density, will deviate from the true regression line. So for example, the actual bacterial CFU log transformed can vary from the true regression line by 1.215 CFUs is how you would interpret this. And if the average bacterial density, like we saw, is 0.852 CFUs log transformed, then um, if you divide these two, any prediction would, might be off by 70%, which is actually quite a lot. And the degrees of freedom represents how many data points were went into estimating these parameters. When we have more data, we can be more sure, have greater assurance that the thing that we saw is not probably due to chance. And so that's why taking into account the sample size or in statistical language, in this case, degrees of freedom is important for estimating that. Oh, and the final thing is uh, R squared. So we talked about R squared in lecture, but essentially it's how well the model matches the actual data or the proportion of variance. And so here we're going to use the adjusted R squared and we can say that 9.9% of the variance, um, because this is 0 0.009, so 0.9% of the variance in bacterial CFUs, after being long transformed, again, that's what the Y is, can be explained by the X nectar volume. And we like to use the adjusted R squared because it accounts for difference in sample size because R squared is affected by sample size. Oh, and last but not least, I always think it's the last one, but this is the real last one is the F statistic. So the F statistic indicates whether there's a relationship between our X and Y variables and the further the F statistic is from one, the better. Um, this is just another thing that can corroborate our interpretation. However, mostly we uh, report p-values and sample sizes. The last thing I'm going to tell you about is how to plot a linear regression line. So in the previous video, I went through kind of what a lot of these general plotting things are. And so this in this video, I'm just going to explain how to add a line that shows your linear regression. So here, this uh, defines the axes. Um, OK, in plot, you can say what your x and y data is going to be. Um, name it your x and y axes, rotate the axis labels, give it a title, and then finally this line adds a linear regression line where you tell it what our model is. Remember, this was the object that we use the LM function to define. So this is our linear regression model, and we're going to say, please color it red. Of course, you can color it different things. And this aligns with our interpretation of the output. So remember, we use that output to write down what the equation is for this line. Bacterial density is predicted by minus 0 0.06 nectar volume. So that is the slope of this line plus 0 0.0852. And that's about where the y-intercept is in this plot. And the interpretation, remember, is the average log transform density of bacteria when considering all nectar volumes is 0.85202. OK, that's exactly right on our plot. And for every one per, every one microliter increase in nectar volume, it looks like bacterial density decreases by 0 0.06 CFUs after being log transformed. Um, and that seems about right. However, one thing you might be wondering when you actually look at the data and plot it is where 
are what are we doing about all of these zeros so having zero inflated data can influence the statistical analysis that you want to do and something that we'll be addressing later in class but that's something that i just wanted to point out to you that this looks all fine and dandy however perhaps that's that line would actually be best modeled something up here instead of down here it may be getting pulled down by the zero inflated data and maybe we need to uh, use a different statistical model in order to for example model flowers that have had some bacteria versus no bacteria separately. So that's just something to consider. And with that, I appreciate you watching this video. Hopefully this is helpful and please feel free to reach out to your TAs with any questions you may have.